Awesome. And <clears throat> so we had this play that, that we would run, and I was the only one that they, that they called it for. It wasn't, I didn't get the ball. It was for my block, okay? So I was a receiver. So I had to line up right here, okay? Ball's over there. And Joel would be the guy that I had to block. And if I blocked him, we would go 10, 15, 20 yards because we had a great running back, and it's just the way it was set up. If I missed him, tackled for a loss. All right, so <clears throat> I was right here watching the ball. Ball gets snapped. Boom, I'm off. I'm, I'm running as hard as I can, and I miss the guy. And we got tackled for a loss. So uh, I, I heard the loving voice of my coach from the sideline, and he said, well, I can't say exactly what he said. He said, Jacobs, get your unnamed body part in there and make that block, okay? Now, here's what I, I, I could have taken that two ways. I could have heard, I'm mad at you. Why can't you do that? You're terrible. That's what I could have heard. But actually, what I heard was, because I had relationship with him, I heard, we, we designed this play because you're there. I know you can do it. Now, wake up and do what I know you can do. That's what I heard. Fast forward, we ran it two more times that game. Next time, got the block. We went 20, 25 yards. I don't remember. The time after that, I got the guy, knocked him off his feet into the next guy, and got them both. Now, that was cool, especially the next day when they did it on film and they rewind. Anyways, that's just a football thing. That's kind of the message I'm going to give today, okay? If I can get what's inside of me with this message out, I should be extremely passionate and it should be a wake-up call okay not that we're not already awake but let's amp it up a bit and I'm preaching to myself okay so I'm gonna watch the video when we get done and preach to myself so if you think I'm just being mean I'm not being mean I'm preaching to me all right real quick how many of you love your families a lot. I saw some hands go down. That's rude. I'm just kidding. All right. So keep your hands up. How many of you are not going to raise your hand whether, no matter what I ask you? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. All right. I know one back in the back row wearing a coat and married to me. Um, so, uh, all right. So you love your families, right? How many of you would say that there's nothing they could do that could ever, just pick one. Pick your favorite one. That there's nothing that they would ever do to take your love away from them. Keep your hands up if that's... Oh, this is going to be fun. All right. Cool. You can put your hands down now. We'll get to that. So right now, uh, it's not up there, but we're actually in a series called The Cost, right? Are we still in that? We're still in that, whether we are or we're not. Called The Cost. Luke 14. You don't have to turn there. It's fine. I didn't tell you to. I've got mine bookmarked. Luke 14, 26 through 28, and then again, verse 33. This is Jesus speaking. If you want to be my follower, you must love me more than your own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, more than your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And you cannot be my disciple if you do not carry your own cross and follow me. But don't begin until you count the cost. Jesus said, you need, you need to pay attention to this. I want you with me, but don't even start until you've counted the cost. What is the cost? Verse 33, no one can become my disciple without giving up everything for me. The cost is everything. I'm not talking about material things. I'm talking about you. Us, me, everything. We're going to get there. Luke 9, 23, 24, take up your cross daily and deny yourself. John 15, 13, greater love has no one except to give up his life for another. <clears throat> so the cost is we have to give up everything. Can I be real with you guys? I'm going to be real with you guys. I'm not going to ask you. 
Scripture tells us when we come to church, we're supposed to bring something. We're supposed to have something to give. If church was for me, waking up on Sunday morning, doing my normal thing, coming to church, saying hi to some people, sitting down, singing some songs, um, listening to a message, saying goodbye to some folks, going home and watching football, I wouldn't come. Games start at 11. I'd stay at home and watch them. I, it, doesn't, it doesn't do anything for me. This is just me personally. But it doesn't do anything for me to come here and just be a, a watcher. I can't think of the... Spe, uh, spectator, that's the word. It's to be a spectator. I've got to be involved. I've got to do... So, I've got to find somebody and pray for them. I've got to find somebody and give them a word. I've got to... I, that's what I've got to do. Because otherwise, what's the point? I know a lot of people would hear that and go, well, you need to be in church to hear God. No, I don't. No, you don't. You can hear God at home. If it's just you and God, you can do that anywhere because he's inside of you and he's everywhere. So you don't have to come here. So I got a word. Let's see if my phone will work. I got a word a couple, couple weeks ago thinking about this message. I heard this clearly, very clearly. This people will completely revolutionize this city and surrounding communities when we stop making church and Christianity about ourselves and instead make it about love. Loving others and loving God. Then there was a pause and then I heard this. Actually, there will be a people that does this. Will it be you? Will it be us? The cost is everything. We'll get into more of what that cost is here in just a minute. So uh, this is really interesting because of the, uh, the verse that Taylor brought up. It's Mark 16. Um, I don't just know that. I have it written down. Um, so we do. We pursue the supernatural here at this church. We pursue signs and wonders. And we're supposed to. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1 says, earnestly desire the gifts of the Spirit. That's what it says, right? Yes, that's right, Aaron. I'll, uh, I'll encourage myself. It's okay. <clears throat> Did you know that salvation is not a requirement for performing the supernatural? Did you know that you don't have to be saved to heal somebody? How many does that mess with? It messed with me, but it's true. Matthew 7, verses 21, 23. Jesus says, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we heal the sick? Didn't we do many miracles and signs? And he says, depart from me, for I never knew you. The things you did were unauthorized. Man, that sounds harsh. Well, it is, because they weren't saved. Yet they did all these miracles. Salvation is not a requirement for, for miracles. It's not. So, in that, in that verse, he says, uh, depart from me, for, my, for I never knew you. So it's not knowing God, it's not believing that all this, this is all part of it, okay? I understand that. But it's not just believing that Jesus died for our sins. That's not the key. Key is us being known by God. Now God knows everything, knows everybody, knows every hair on your head. He knows everything about you. But that word known there is experiential. It's relational. The key is God getting to interact with us and us with him. That's the key. All right, so the first time I read this many years ago, I kind of freaked out. Not going to lie to you. How do I know? How do I know you know me? How do, I, how do I know that? Before we get there, 1 Corinthians 13. Sorry, I kind of got ahead of myself. 1 Corinthians 13. This is along the lines of uh, salvation, not a requirement for uh, supernatural. First Corinthians 13 is called the love chapter, right? We call it the love chapter. Typically, you only hear it on wedding days, and they read it, and it's all. No, I think it's the God chapter, and I think it may be one of the most important chapters in the whole Bible. That's what I think, because it says, Scripture, not this chapter, but another one, says, God is love. That's what it says, right? God is love. Love is not a characteristic of God. It's actually the substance that makes him up. He is love. 
This is the love chapter. I've renamed it. It's the God chapter. I just took that liberty. First Corinthians 13. I'm reading in the New Living, so you may have a, a, a different one, but it says uh, a different version. It says, if I could speak in any language in heaven or on earth, but didn't love others, I would only be making meaningless noise like a loud gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I knew all the mysteries of the future and knew everything about everything, that's funny the way that it words that. If I knew everything about everything, but didn't love others, what good would I be? And if I had the gift of faith so that I could speak to a mountain and make it move, without love, I would be no good to anybody. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would be of no value whatsoever. He says you can have everything the Spirit does. You can perform miracles. You can do all of that. But if you don't have love, <laughs> nothing. Jesus said people are going to go to hell. And they think that they're doing okay because they do the supernatural. Jesus is saying the supernatural is very basic. It's simple. There's a scripture in there about that. I'm not going to go into it because I didn't study it, but it's in there. I'm not downplaying the supernatural. I want it more than anything. But I want, thing, I want priorities. I've got to have love. I've got to be love. All right. So we're going to back up. So you can have all that. You don't have love. You don't have anything. The key is being known by God, right? Very quickly, I'll run you through this. Being known by God is the key. 1 Corinthians 8.13. I read this and my mind just, because I had the question, like, how do I know if you know me? 1 Corinthians 8.13. Whoever loves God is known by God. Very simple. John 14.15. If you love me, obey my commands. I'm giving you a little circle here. I'm tying it all together. Matthew, so if you love me, obey my commands. Okay, well, what are your commands? Well, there's a lot of them, but he summed it up in two. Matthew 22, 37 through 40, the greatest commandment and the second greatest commandment, which is love God with, we'll say it this way, love God with everything you have, all that is you, love God. And then he says, and love others as you love yourself, which I think is a huge key because we don't realize that there is, no, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're in Jesus, you are not condemned. And you have every reason to love yourself. Why? Because he loves you. We love him because he first loved us. And if we can love us because of that, all the stuff that we do, all the stuff that is wrong, that we try to attain to some sort of right living, all of that stuff and wash clean the stuff that you have done the stuff that you're doing the stuff that you're gonna do it's all been been washed clean our goal is to make our actions and our lives align with that reality and I'm just I'll, I'll go ahead and say this that when we do that all that stuff that we try to do right and not sin it goes away anyways because it's in love So love God, love others. Greater love has no one except to lay down his life for another. That doesn't mean die for them. Could It could, but that does, that's not what he's referring to. Check my time. He's not referring... Okay, again, could be. He did it. He laid down his life and actually died for us. But that's not what he's talking about. He's actually talking about living your lives for others. The greatest commandment is to love God, and the second greatest is to love others. Nowhere in there does he say, uh, make sure that you have a really good connection with me. That's, that's a really important thing. No, you love God, okay? I, I get that I'm on, I'm on sketchy ground here because you're like, oh, well, you're supposed to have a good connection. Well, of course you are. But the goal is your life is not so you have a good connection with God. It is, I'm going to love you, God, with everything that I have. Because you paid for me. I'm giving it all up for you. Is this making sense at all? Is it? You look confused now. Maybe I confuse you. 
The point is our lives are not our own. Our, our lives are for other people. Our life is for God. He paid for it. He gets it. And then in return, he wants us to live our lives for other people. I'll show you what I mean. 1 Corinthians 13. You still there? Two people. All right. <clears throat> Verse 4. Four. Don't read it. Don't read it. Don't read 4. Don't read it. All right. Everybody that raised your hands when I asked you if you loved your family and there's nothing that they could ever do to take your love away from you from them, raise your hand. Uh, if you raise it, you got to raise it now. So, all right. You can put your hand down, but everybody hold everybody else accountable. Because this is what Jesus did to me. He says, you love your wife? Of course I love my wife. All the time? All the time. Anything she could do to take your love away from you? from her no no nothing and he says have you ever been impatient with her yeah he's like well love is patient so if you were impatient then you weren't loving her okay have you ever been unkind to her yeah i have been well love is kind so if you were being unkind then you weren't loving her you ever been rude okay okay i get it i mean he'd take me through the whole list Right? But it's true. Because why? I've told myself this, this lie before and listened to it. I love them. Not talking about my wife or my kids here, but other people. I love them. I just don't like them. How many people have said that? Be honest. Come on. Yeah, exactly. It's a lie. Jesus says one and the same. Because it's not your life. You're supposed to be patient. You're supposed to be kind. That doesn't mean you have to be buddy-buddy and go hang out with them all the time. I mean, we're all different people, right? Sounds like I just contradicted myself. Maybe I did. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous. Love is not boastful. Love is not proud. Love is not rude. This next one gets me. Love does not demand its own way. Ouch! Man, that hurts. But it feels so good right well no no i can i can i can take a stand because i didn't do anything wrong and they're just in a bad mood and they need to change their mood and when they change their mood then i won't tell them what i need it's not what it's saying love does not demand its own way well what do you do when your family members are rude to you you love them Here's the hard part. Love doesn't tell the other person, um, you're demanding your own way right now. You're not loving me. Love doesn't do that. That's demanding your own way. It's just loving them. I wanted my wife to be here. Now I'm second guessing that. Love is not irritable. Man. It just gets tougher and tougher and tougher. And it keeps no record of when it has been wronged. It is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. This one's tough because we do have an election right now, right? So we watch the debates. Oh, got him, got her. When it's just trash anyways, right? Rejoicing in injustice. That's, what, that's how I interpret that anyways. Just an example. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. Love is always hopeful. And love endures through every circumstance. Our lives are not meant for our own. Our lives are meant for other people. All other people. So going back to the verse that, that Taylor mentioned, Mark 16, I think it's verse 17. It says, uh, Whoever believes in me, these signs shall follow. Lay your hands on the sick, they'll get better. That's my translation. I don't really remember the verse, but you guys know which one I'm talking about, right? And if you don't, it's Mark 16, verse 17. Go back and read it. The thing that kills me about that verse is it says that these signs will follow those. So I've been pondering that. Like, I, I don't understand. Scripture does this. Watch my time. Scripture says this. It doesn't do this. It, it says this. That 
Um, I don't remember what verse, so I'm, I apologize. I don't have this verse memorized. But there is a verse that, contra- that, that compares belief and obedience. And it basically says, um, if you believe Jesus, da 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 but for everyone who does not obey. So if you believe, then you obey. We've already seen that you could compare obedience and loving God. It's all about love. Every bit of it. Is it possible that we only see some supernatural signs, some healings, some this, some that, because there's a, maybe a love deficit in the church? Is that possible? It's possible in me. I'll be honest with you. I don't love everyone the way that I should. I still get mad at the guy when he cuts me off in the car. You know? That's what I think. I really do, I really do think that. I don't know it yet because I haven't seen the evidence, but I think once we get this love thing figured out, supernatural goes up. We don't do it for the supernatural, right? They're just a sign that point to a reality like an exit sign. You don't crawl through the exit sign, you go through the door, right? Supernatural sign just points to God. God loves you. Here's how you know. All right, I'm going to end, and then I'm going to finish. Why is love so important? Here's the thing. I'm just going to take a sidebar. Right now, I have my notes. I'm going down. I'm just fine. I have no idea if this is making sense to anyone. Makes sense to me, okay? But I have no idea if it's making sense to you guys, so I apologize. He asked me this morning, how much do you have? I'm like, 15 minutes or an hour? I don't know, I could speak on this all day long. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to tie it all together, but I, I'm not sure I'm doing a great job of it, so forgive me. But why is love so important? John 17. Other than all the reasons that we've already named, and I'm going to go to a few more that will be a little more personal, but I want to I read this verse. John 17, verse 21, 23. My prayer for all of them is that they will be one. This is Jesus praying, and he actually says this is for all believers that will come after me. My prayer for all of them is that they will be one just as you and I are one. one. Father, that just as you are in me and I am in you, so they will be in us, and the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are, I and them and you and me all being perfected into one. Then the world will know that you sent me and will understand that you love them as much as you love me. The key to the salv- to, to salving, the key to saving the world is our love for one another. It's actually, it's actually believer specific. Because how many of you want to be a part of a group when the group is just in disarray. No one, right? That's crazy. Why would I want to go be a part of that? But when you see that unity, just think of teams or groups that you've, you've, you've seen where they start meshing and they start coming together and you can tell that the, one of them is there for all of them and all of them is there for one of them. Why wouldn't you want to be a part of that group? Look at our country right now. Oh my gosh, what? Our country is not how it used to be, for sure. It seems like, at least um, through the media, which who knows about that, but it seems that through the media, things are getting worse. People are not beating down the doors to come into our churches. How much unity is there in the church? Not much. I mean, how many church splits have there been in the past week throughout the country? Who knows, but I'm guessing it's been a few. People get angry and they get upset because you said this or you did this and I don't believe that and you believe this and oh my gosh, 
That's not what the scriptures say. The scripture. Who wants to be a part of that? But if you come to a person and you say, you know what? I don't really believe everything that they say. But I'm going to love them. Because Jesus loves them. And I'm going to stand with them. I promise you, I could stand up here today and tell you things that I believe. And before I was done, we'd all be just offended at each other. Because if we went down that road, okay? Because I believe things that you don't. And you believe things that I don't. But it doesn't matter. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me. He loves everybody in the whole world. And he wants everybody with him in heaven forever. What else do we need? Well, I don't believe in healing. Okay, so what do you do with the ones when somebody says, you know, I'd heal you in Jesus' name and they get healed? You don't have to believe in healing. But there's no sense in being upset about it. They don't believe in healing. We're not better than them. We're nothing. We have to give up our lives, everything, all of it, all of our desires. Give it all up and hand it to Jesus and say, here's my life. How do I love other people? You tell me. That's the key. That's the goal. When we walk out of here today, some of you are going to go to lunch. Love on your waiter or waitress. Sunday's the worst day to wait tables. The rudest people, the lowest tips. Let's change that. But let's change it every day. Let's just start loving people. Signs will follow. Signs will follow, but let's just start loving people. Has any of this made sense? Good. Just discount all that didn't. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm just going to restate it. Todd White says it this way. You guys don't know Todd White? Look him up. It's good stuff. What's funny is when you listen to Todd, he's going to make you do one of two things. You're either going to be completely humbled and go, I want that. Or you're going to go, there's no way that's real. And you might do a little bit of both. I think I did, but I love the guy. Never met him, but I love the guy. He says it this way. The cost to follow Jesus is nothing more than what you were never created to be in the first place. We were never created to live our own lives. We were created to give our lives to Jesus. And we were created to love other people. We were never created to demand our own way, to be impatient, to be selfish. Never created for that. That's the key. When we, when we die to ourselves, deny ourselves, die to ourselves, however you want to say it, we step into a place with Jesus where he has complete access to every part of us. If you read 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, and you should, and you look at the, uh, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, those two things, you put them together, there's no stress there. We were not created to live in stress. When we get stressed, we get sick, we get tired, we get irritable, we get impatient, we get, I mean, you see what I'm saying? So we weren't created to live in stress. That's what Jesus wants to give us, life and abundance, that he says in John 10. And that's all that it is. You give me your life, I'll give you life and abundance. And then that is complete peace. It's complete love. It's complete health. I know, I'm getting crazy now. I'm talking about divine health here on earth. I, I think it's possible. I do. Because he said he could do infinitely above, beyond, more than I could ever dare to dream or ask or think I'm not sure how that goes but it's that covers it and I've thought that and I think it's possible and he can do better okay I'm gonna be done
What's interesting was I was going to end the same way that Taylor started, praying for everybody, if you, if you wanted stuff. I'm still going to pray for you. <clears throat> There's people here today, and they, you... You're dealing with anxiety. Anxiety comes from worry. I dealt with it for years. Years. Made me physically ill. Had no idea what was wrong with me. It's a lie. It's a lie straight from the enemy of God. There's people in here that that are struggling and dealing with depression. These are the two things that I heard coming in today. Dealing with depression. The lie. The one who created everything gave up everything for you. You are worth it. You're worth everything. It's a lie. The hard part about that is, is, the, is getting to the point where you can believe not listening to the lie. And I get that. I get that maybe more, more than most people. I don't know. I get that. I was there. It's as simple as this. The thoughts come, whether it be worry, fear, so anxiety, or depression. The thoughts come. And it's, it literally is this. That's not what Jesus says. He says this. And then you align your, your body, everything in you, you align your actions into that truth, not the lie. It is, it is, it's that, it's that simple. It's not easy all the time, but it is that simple. And then as you get traction and you start believing the truths, then when those lies come, say, nope, and you walk the other way, it's the, it is, the, it's that, it becomes that easy. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray right now. I don't need hands. You don't have to. You can stand up if you want, but it's, you're doing it for you and the Lord. It's not for me. But if you deal with anxiety or depression, those two things, we're going to break that off of you right now. And I just want to point out, I'm praying right now, and you're praying right now, and we're agreeing, we're two or more agree on anything. It will be done, right? That's what it says. But let me tell you something. It was broken off of you 2,000 years ago. It's already been done. So we're going to do it right now because because that's good and it's completely viable if that's the right word. I'm not even sure that that is a word. But it's completely worthy to do it right now. But the truth is it has already been done. So Lord, I thank you right now that you are the Prince of Peace. God, that in you, perfect love casts out all fear. Lord, that you said we, we shouldn't pray, worry, about every, worry about anything but pray about everything. Lord, there's people in this room that know that scripture. They've quoted to themselves. They've said it over and over again. And they sit there and they pray and they say, I'm not supposed to worry. I'm not supposed to worry. I'm praying. I'm praying. I'm not supposed to worry. I'm praying. I'm praying. God, I ask that you break that off of them just like you broke it off of me. And that we step in to pray and it is, Jesus, there is no fear in you. I am not afraid because you are with me. And that is it. God, that that courage and that boldness that it takes to step into that and not worry. God, that you would pre present that to those who are dealing with anxiety. And God, with depression, Lord, I ask right now in your name that your love for every person in this room overwhelm every heart. God, that your love for all of us would actually flow over us like the oil that we spoke about this morning, that you would anoint us with your love. Because love never fails. 
Love endures to the end. Amen. That's good stuff. Last thought I'll leave you with, because I, because I, I did say it, and 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 I'm saying it for me. Is that when we live our lives, every day, not just coming to church, but every day, when we leave our homes, when we're in our homes, when we go to bed at night, when we wake up in the morning, that we begin to fix our thoughts to renew our mind and the reality that our lives are not ours. They're the lives of Jesus, they, they are given to Jesus and the purpose is to love other people. Bless you guys. Thanks.